Hi. 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 It's so nice to see some women in here. Because all these ugly looking dudes, man, it gets old, bro. And it gets just old after a while. Because you go to these conventions and they're like, dude, I love you. And I go, dude, I'm married. Give it a rest. Pull it back. So it's nice to see some. <laughs> it's nice to see some. No, I, I kid, I kid, of course. But um, there's some fine, handsome uh, gentlemen in here, too. And I, I welcome you all. Uh, a little fewer and farther between, but I welcome you all anyway. I, I do. I, you, you give me your glasses? Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Welcome to the Greg Villengain's Flying by the Seat of Your Pants Hour. Because I have no idea what I'm doing. But I do strongly encourage uh, and welcome all questions. You ask me and you'll get the answer. So uh, let's do that because uh, I, I, I don't, you know. And, and I'll give illustrations, too, you know, so no worries about that. But let's see, how, where do I start? Well, let's start at the beginning. So I was uh, born a poor white child in the, um, <laughs> in the streets of uh, Detroit, Michigan. And, uh, yeah, you, you like that one. That was good, right? Did you, did you like that one? That was good. Did you, he, he got a good life out of that. So, no, I am from Detroit, and... Um, uh, people uh, often ask me, how did I start? Um, and what gave me my start? And my answer is the grace of God. Amen. Period. Uh, because he will give you your dreams, whether you believe it or not. He will give you your dreams. Because you'll, you'll find yourself saying stuff that you don't even know where it came from, right? I remember in, junior, in uh, high school, in high school, I went to Cash Tech, and I, w I remember saying to friends of mine in high school, man, I'm going to play with Stevie Wonder one day. Well, now, what would, what would make you say that? I, I, I distinctly remember telling friends, I'm going to play with. And, you know, I was enamored by him. I, I, I was obsessed by him. I had posters of him on my walls and everything. You know, I, and I listened to him uh, constantly. And uh, I just became so connected with him musically. It was, it was really quite amazing and um uh you know when i was a lot younger i was uh too shy to sing out loud but i would always sing like in private you know or in the, at home in the car whatever and um i i'd find myself singing along with him you know uh and you know it's not only he wasn't only brilliant with his music he was brilliant with other people's music right because for instance like um as if my Sharia Moore and, you know, uh, all those uh, hits weren't enough. Like, he would take a Beatles song and something, you know, not even as high profile as, you know, I don't know, uh, uh, yesterday or something like that. He would take, like, We Can Work It Out. You know, like, we can work it out, we can work it out. And all of a sudden... I see in my way. And it's like, who does that? <laughs> who starts out a song like, that was just brilliant. It was, just, And that's what he did with the Beatles song. So, um, uh, you know, stuff like that. And so then I'll try to make this bit of the story short. Uh, it did, no? Keep it long? Okay. Well, hey, if you got the time, I'll just be here. I don't care. Um, <laughs> Uh, they said it was an hour, so hopefully there's nothing else after this, and then we can just stay and hang, and the guys can take me home, and we'll <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, uh, so uh, there was a dear friend of mine who was a drummer, and he was asked to audition for Stevie by a former band member. Uh, uh, he was asked to go to New York and audition for him. And uh, so we were very, very close and so obviously I was thrilled for him so I went to his house the night before he left and you know just in the basement he's packing and we're talking and we're just so excited and but he insisted that I uh, play some things on a cassette and he would give to Steve and uh, I 
I just, that's the kind of friend he was, right? So oh. I remember one of the things I played, I played like about four songs on that set. And, and so uh, one of them I remember was, uh, kind of thing you know I was playing stuff like that but I wanted to play because I was I felt so connected to him I wanted to uh, let him know subliminally that I kind of understood how he thinks so I wanted to play it you know as close to the record as I could so I played it like that I didn't sing I just played you know instrumentally and I played some other things oh I think I remember playing this too remember that Remember that song, Goddess? So um, I was playing stuff like that. And uh, so my friend took the cassette. He left the next day for New York. And uh, it seemed like an eternity. It was probably like, I don't know, a couple, two, three days. And then he calls me early in the morning and says, Stevie Wonder wants to see you in New York today. <laughs> what do you do? So I am like running around the house like a bouncing up it. <laughs> so um, my mother is like, a, I told you it'd be fun illustrations, right? You know. So I'm running around like this, and my mother's like, "What is the matter with you?" I said, "I'm going to New York to be Stevie Wonder." She says, "Well, just make sure you bring clean underwear," because she was West Indian, you know, and all, that's all your mothers care about. You know, just did he have clean underwear? You could be like dying on the gurney in the ambulance on the way to the hospital, and you know, all they want to know—they're just—they're just telling me there were no tracks. That's all they—that's all they care about. <laughs> so um, I'm packing and I'm going uh, to. Okay, hang on. Sorry. Well, you know, this is part of the live experience. My phone's ringing. Who's this? Oh, okay. Well, hang, uh, no, actually, no, actually, it's Mike Phillips. Hang on, Mike. I'm good, but listen, I'm in the middle. Uh, huh? <laughs> well, you should have almost gotten a divorce because that's because you messed up. <laughs> no, I'm I'm kidding. Listen, she did. Okay. Well, here, <laughs> here's the funny thing that you don't know. I'm doing a live uh, webcast workshop right now. I'm at Sweetwater's. Uh, Gear Fest in Fort Wayne, and I just put you on blast. You're like, you know, like, like there's a room for like a couple hundred people in here, and they're la they're all laughing. Hey, hey, Mike. Yeah, they're they're saying hi to you right now. Say hi, Mike. Hi. Yeah, that's there they are. <laughs> what? You're in Fort Wayne too. You're here. That's hysterical. <laughs> That's, seriously? <laughs> Are you playing with me? Tonight? Oh, that's hysterical. Okay, well, see you tonight. <laughs> Sweet. Okay, cool. Well, listen, I got. I gotta go. I'll. I'll see you later tonight. Thanks, man. Okay. Bye. Okay, that's Mike Phillips. He's playing tonight, so we're going to jam together, I guess. He, he says, well, the joke's on you. I'm here. <laughs> so, um, okay, so where was I? Uh, so so I, I get the news that I'm, I'm going to uh, meet Stevie in New York, but guess what? I am instructed to stop by Stevie's house and pick up one of his brothers. So now I get to go to his house. And I had no, I knew where he lived because uh, there, there, were, there was a certain group of us kids that, you know, kind of knew where, where he lived. And, and there were these urban legends of, you know, if you caught him at the right time, you could actually see him in the backyard shooting hoops. Uh, <laughs> and I, 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 I would not be surprised because my man, Steve, is the most visually oriented blind person I have ever met in my entire life. I can tell you stories about him that will just have you shaking your head. Um, 
And he probably could shoot hoops. But one thing I know he can do, because I did it with him, was he can play air hockey. He's a beast. A beast at air hockey. So what happens is he'll be, you know, he'll hunker down and everything. And, you know, his eyes, uh, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to see his eyes, but they, 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 they move independently. They don't stay still. And that's a, that's a common characteristic with blind people. They'll be like this and move around like this. But when he's concentrating on something, then they go still like this. <laughs> so, like, he'll, you know, like, he'll be playing and he'll be moving around. And then when he's concentrating, he'll be like. <laughs> and it's really bizarre. But he can play, man. He's got that radar thing down. And he can just knock. So, anyway, so I pick up one of his brothers. We go to the airport and fly to New York and get settled at the hotel. I go to the uh, original Hit Factory studio. And um, I'm sitting there on pins and needles just waiting, 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 waiting. I'm trying to be cool. I'm really trying desperately to be cool. I'm just sitting there. And there's small talk with the engineers and everything. And, and uh, all of a sudden, finally, hours later, the elevator door opens. And you can see in this monitor because there was only one way to go in and out. And, and I look up at the monitor. And here he comes. And he's coming, in. and so that single handshake when he extended his hand. Again, they said uh, it's Steve Gregg's here, and he extended his hand and he said, "Hey, nice to meet you." That handshake changed my life, right there. And we met. We had a bit of small talk, and he actually showed me a, a song, uh, a, a, an unreleased song at the time, and he wanted to know if I could keep up and, and play it, you know. And uh, uh, you know, I gave him my. You want to hear it? Okay. So, um, so it went like this. Um. Oh, shoot, no. Wait, wait. Okay, sorry. Now, that song was called Spring High, and it was since released uh, years later, and he gave it to Ramsey Lewis. He was supposed to give it to me, but he gave it to Ramsey Lewis, and I, I forgave him for it. So um, that was the first song of Steve's I ever learned that was, that was you know, new, unreleased, you know, that, that, that out of the other stuff uh, that I already knew. So that was that night. The next day was more of the formal audition, and it was between me and this uh, older-looking white guy who I found out years later was sent by Chick Corea to audition, right? And I met that guy years later at a NAMM show. And he says, I don't know if you remember, but I'm the other guy that you auditioned against. I went, no way. And so uh, we hugged, and then I choked him, and then we hugged, us, we hugged some more. And, um, but anyway, at that time, it was between me and him. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, I'm, you know, trying to keep it together. But uh, certain band members at, at, at different parts of the day would just kind of brush by me and go, it's OK, you got it. <laughs> and so I played, I did my thing, you know, and, and, and then, uh, so then uh, it's later that evening. And I'm in the car with Steve on the way back to the Hit Factory from the, re from the rehearsal hall. And he turns around and he goes, so how does it feel to be a member of Wonder Love? So I'm like, uh, 
And then, uh, I, so I, now I'm thinking my head. And this is all in the space of nanoseconds, right? It's like, oh, I don't know. What does he Because then I heard all these other stories about how he's a practical joker, and you never know if he's serious or not. Because he, he would call you in a completely different voice. You'd never know it was him for like the first five minutes. And, you know, he does stuff like that. So I says, well, uh, are you serious? He goes, of course. I says, well, then would you mind telling my mom? That I figure you ain't going to lie to mom. <laughs> we get to the studio. I pick up the phone and call the house, give the phone to him. The first voice my mom hears is Stevie Wonders telling her that he wants to have her son and his band. He's going to take care of him and all this kind of nice stuff, you know, and uh, you know, they have a little chat for a couple of minutes, and then he hands the phone back to me. And this is what you hear for about the next 10 minutes. <laughs> so, um, both of us. I was, <laughs> he said, you or your mom. I, it was, both of us were screaming like that. So, uh, so uh, yeah, that's how that happened. Now. That was April 2nd, 1975, one month before my 19th birthday and one month before his 25th. He was working on Songs in the Key of Life at 25. Just roll that around in your head for a minute. So our, day, our birthdays are one day and six years apart. I'm May 12th. He's the 13th. And um, it was just, you talk about a match made in heaven. I mean, I, he was Stevie and I was Stevie Jr. He, <laughs> and so we're working on, the, and so like I, I uh, was, well, before, wait, before I go farther, um, my dear friend, the drummer who auditioned, did not get the gig. But he ended up with Roy Ayers who was hanging around at the time. He says, well, if you don't get it with Stevie, you got it with me. So he took my friend, and then our paths kind of went like this, and then we came back together uh, sometime later, and, you know, we ended up doing all kinds of stuff together. Uh, the only sad thing is that I have to use the word was because he's no longer with us, and I still can't believe it, um, you know, four years later. But that guy was Ricky Lawson. Yes, really. Uh, my dear, dear friend. And I, I can't speak enough about Ricky. Uh, the kind of friend he was, the kind of man he was. You know, you hear people say, well, so-and-so will give you the shirt off his back. He literally would give you the shirt off his back. I mean, like, seriously. And um, he never lost the joy of simple things. Like, he would demand that he wash your car. I'm serious. He said, you know, I got I to gotta wash your car. And he would do that to me all the time, and I would constantly turn him down, and he said, why don't you let me wash your car? So he said it to me one too many times. I said, okay, you know what? Fine. You can wash my car. I got to go out of town for a few days, and I'll be back, and I'll leave the car out, and you can come and wash. And at the time, I had a Range Rover. Do you know he came over and actually washed my car? And when I got back, it looked like I just bought it. He was crazy like that. He was absolutely a wonderful, genuine, soulful, beautiful uh, human being, and I, I miss him dearly. But, and then of course, you know, we went on uh, to do uh, the Bad and Dangerous tours together uh, with Michael and all kinds of other stuff. Um, and I'm forever grateful for his friendship. So that's basically the story of that. Uh, and, uh, what else? Oh, yeah, so, I, um, I, I'm, I'm on four songs on Songs in the Key of Life. Four. Uh, one of them is, uh, Going back to San and with Dreams are good. Don't need cars because we just learn to fly on Saturn. That. Saturn? I forget some of the lyrics, but that was that. And then another one is um, uh, one of my all time favorites. Uh, uh, you, you, you made life his. Story. 
You brought some joy inside my tears. I'm in the wrong key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Made life history. You brought some joy inside my tears. And, you know, we were, we were doing string parts on a beautiful uh, contemporary instrument called uh, the Dream Machine by Yamaha. And it was this big white, it was three keyboards, you know, and it, was, it looked like, a, like a, a, a futuristic version of uh, those old Wurlitzer organs that used to be in the movie theaters. Well, it was like a futuristic version of that. It was huge. Uh, well, maybe because I was so short, but it was huge. Had these two massive speakers. They were like this tall. And there were like three in the world. Of course, Stevie O was two of them. And um, we would do the string parts. And I remember sitting next to him on the bench, you know, and we're just doing these, working these string parts out. And both of our heads were like. <laughs> and it was just really sweet moments like that that I'll never forget. And another one. Um, Another one is this uh, instrumental. Um, remember that? So that was uh, uh, Contusion. And the only reason why I'm on that is because the bridge section uh, that Michael Cimbello wrote, uh, you know, the guitarist, Michael Cimbello, the great artist, uh, he, he was... Uh, um, a student of Pat Martino's, you know, and so he, he would come up with these ridiculously crazy lines, you know. And the bridge had this crazy line uh, uh, that Michael played, but Stevie couldn't play it. <laughs> but I could. <laughs> so that's how I ended up doing this. So that's how I ended yeah. <laughs> um, so there's that. And then there was this other little thing. Isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? Isn't she precious? Less than one minute, oh, I can't believe what God has done through us, he's given life to one, but isn't she lovely, made from love? Yep, that was on me. And uh, the crazy thing is, I, you know, we were in New York at the time, and I remember being in this brownstone and being... Uh, on the, like the third floor, and looking down at the crib at her, going, oh, uh, 43, 43 years later, it's Aisha. She's got two kids of her own, and she's uh, gorgeous, wonderful, and uh, so uh, th that's a, uh, obviously a, a special um, thing with me, too. And with Songs in the Key of Life, I have had no less than four full circle moments off of that album alone. You want to hear him? Okay. First of all, it was, uh, you know, recording on the album. And then, and then the first one was recreating the entire album live uh, for uh, one of Stevie's charity events. We'd, he, he'd always wanted to do that, and so he called me up and said, uh, you know, it's time I want to do this, you know. And uh, so I came in as music director, and it was a thrill of my life uh, obviously because of the connection and uh, I, I approached it like we were doing a, a classical piece by Beethoven or Bach or Mozart. I wanted, I wanted to keep it authentic and do everything exactly like the record and uh, it was just a fantastic night. So that was the first one. Then, second full circle moment is touring off of that album. We did a whole tour and the first show was at Madison Square Garden, and it was like a religious experience. People lost their minds because, you know, like, uh, you know, lights go down, and the first thing you hear is, Woo! and people just went crazy. And so that's the second uh, full circle moment. And then the third full circle moment was doing the 
TV, the uh, Grammy TV special honoring him that I was music director for. And then the fourth full circle moment was winning an Emmy for that TV show. So that did not suck. <laughs> so there's that. So, um, so that's the uh, Stevie years. <laughs> And they continue. Um, you know, he, I can't get rid of him. Uh, he's just a dear, dear friend and um, a knucklehead. And uh, he's the one that, you know, started it all for me uh, as far as working with every artist, just about every artist I've ever wanted to. Just about. Uh, okay, so um, let's see. Well, then there's the Jackson era. Guess you want to hear about that one, right? You sure? Nobody's bored yet? <laughs> okay. All right. So the Jacksons. So, uh, oh, but then I can't forget the Quincy. Yeah, the Quincy's important, too. Okay, because also when I was in high school, um, I heard Quincy Jones was coming to do a record signing for his album, You Got a Bad Girl. It was the the... It wasn't a double album, but it folded out like that, and it was him like in the sexy years, and he was like wearing the, the black leather the outfit. You remember that? He was like, <laughs> just sort of like that, you know. And uh, so, he, so he came down for a record signing, and I stood in line and and met him, and he was so wonderful to me and gracious, you know. And he he, uh, I told him I'm a musician, and he goes, Oh yeah, what do you play? And I said, Keyboards. And he said. Uh, Oh, do you have a Fender Rhodes? This was the actually the exchange. And he said, do you have a Fender Rhodes? And I go, no, but I get to use one. Uh, and my uh, one of the band members has one, and I get to play that one. He says, OK, well, you know, he was very encouraging and, and gracious. And uh, that was the first time I met him. And then the second time I met him, which was uh, after uh, I ended up with Stevie uh, in Moving in L.A., uh, when I met him then, he remembered that. And he remembers it to this day. It's uncanny. His memory is frightening, of what, what is in his mind and in his memories. And um, so the first thing uh, I ever worked on with Quincy was um, he and, and Herb Albert were producing Billy Eckstein. <laughs> and and uh, they had me come down and play on a single called The Best Thing. There's a song called The Best Thing, and, and that's when that was the first time I met uh, Herb. And wonderful guy. I didn't get to meet uh, Billy at the time, but uh, that was my first recording with Quincy. And then it just went on and on, and I found myself doing more and more with him. And then one day he called and said, right, we're going to do Michael Jackson's first solo album. Okay. Uh, but that was after I had actually met all the brothers. So how I met the Jacksons was... There's a, a, a dear friend of mine, Bobby Columbi, who was uh, an executive producer at CBS at the time. And, you know, he had talked to me about um, doing more, getting more into arranging. And I said, well, I don't know. I mean, I'd done a good amount of arranging uh, in other situations, but he, he was very encouraging. And he said, you know, you should do more arranging. As a matter of fact, here's who you're going to be doing it with. Next thing I know, I'm in a room with the Jacksons. Like, okay. Well, hi, guys. I guess we'll be working together. So, hi, how are you? And that was for Destiny, right? And so he had me do rhythm arrangements. Uh, and rhythm arrangements simply means, you know, just arrangements for the, for the core band, for the rhythm section. Um, th other people did string and horn arrangements, but I did the rhythm arrangements because, you know, it had to be funky. You know, it has to be funky. So, um, uh, so, um, uh, the first song that I did an arrangement of was this really uh, bubblegum pop thing called "Blame It on the Boogie," right? And it was uh, it was really bubblegum and really white bread. It's from this uh, I think think some band out of uh, uh, Great Britain, and it was like. Don't blame it on the I'm like, well, what am I going to do with that? So I was still with Stevie at the time. So 
my first thought it was always, and kind of still is these days, is, well, what would Stevie do? Right? And that's how we approach it. What would Stevie do? So it's like, nah, maybe not. So I'm saying, well, that's not going to, I have to, that has to stay. But we have to establish, uh, you know, we have to establish a mood for this because it's just too bubblegum and, and for them, and, and they're trying to get out of that. So how do we do that? So I came up with it. <laughs> Just went on from that, you know. So, <laughs> so they kind of like that, and then we kind of went on from there, and uh, you know, on and on and on and on, and then finally, the next thing I know, I'm doing this. And uh, that part they came up with, um, it was the only thing happening musically, um, along with the killer medley, you know, and uh, this dance, let's shout, shake your butt on to the ground, and dance. right? So, but uh, they didn't have much else going on rhythmically, so I thought, well, okay, well, how can we make this really stand out? So I came up with the drum part. Mm, it was me, you didn't know that. If this was uh, together, I'd show you how it goes, but um, I can actually play the drum part. I can play the whole thing myself. Ha, ha, ha. But, but the drummer that we used was a brilliant studio guy named Ed Green. He could not play the whole thing at once. Ha, ha, ha. So he had to do it in three different parts. So he started out with you know just the main thing, just the main groove. Right? And then he would do the tom parts, which go like like that. And then finally, the, the, the third part is the hi-hat, the, the magic hi-hat part that goes but I can do the whole thing all at once, right? So, but, um, but it, it turned out to be really cool and it surprised the brothers because they had no idea, you know, what, what I was thinking about. They're like, how is this going to work? But when they saw it finally come all together, they, they, uh, they got a kick out of it and they, they were impressed, I guess. Um, and uh, that started a, a really wonderful relationship. I actually remember taking some of the brothers to uh, Six Flags Magic Mountain Amusement Park. Yeah. But this was in the early days, so it wasn't, you know, we didn't need like a ton of security. We just kind of rolled up on our own and went and hung out a bit. And um, uh, so it just great times like that. And uh, then uh, Off the Wall with Quincy. And then a even after that, we went back and did the Triumph album uh, with the brothers, too. And, uh, you know, wonderful moments there as well. Uh, but Off the Wall just catapulted Michael, as you know, into the stratosphere. And he became the world's greatest uh, entertainer. And... Uh, so uh, let's see what else. So and then there was uh, Thriller. <laughs> and then there was Bad, which led to the Bad Tour. Uh, Michael asked me in his own uh, unique Michael way uh, to join him for the tour. You know, we, we were working uh, in the studio during the Bad album. And, and, you know, every once in a while he would go, so you like touring, right? I go, yeah. yeah. Um, you really enjoy the live shows, right? I go, yeah, I do. Yeah. You like playing in front of big crowds, right? I go, yeah, I do. <laughs> you really enjoy it. Yeah, I do, Mike. What is this good leading? <laughs> and I finally put two and two together. Oh, you want me to tour with you? <laughs> I said, well, why didn't you just ask? <laughs> so next thing you know, I'm the music director. Uh, I was brought in later on. He, they had already uh, had certain band members, but, um, you know, we, uh, we got Ricky in there, and... Uh, it was just, we, we just killed. I mean, you saw the footage, you know, we killed. Uh, and there's nothing, you haven't lived until you've been in a stadium uh, with 70,000 people lighting torches. Not iPhones, torches, baby. And, uh, you know, you're seeing him get into Man in the Mirror or watching him from like about 10 feet behind do Billie Jean. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. Um, so, uh, and I, you know, there are 
a million wonderful personal moments I have too. But did I ever tell you the story about the time uh, Michael and I went shopping? Yeah. You want to hear that? Yeah. This is I tell this all the time. It's really crazy. It's, I think we were working on bad. Yeah, I think we were working on bad. And there was some downtime in the studio. So he was getting a little restless, and he says, you want to go out? I go, yeah. <laughs> want to go shopping? I say, yeah. Oh, this will be fun. So he says, okay, I'll be back. So he goes, and he puts on this disguise, a big old Afro wig, dark shades, and some jacked up buck teeth. All right? All right? <laughs> now, the studio we were at was <laughs> Westlake, Studios on Beverly Boulevard in L.A. Do you know what's across the street from Westlake Studios? The Beverly Center. This massive mall is like a kitty corner across the street from <laughs> Westlake. And do you know Michael and I walked out the front door and crossed La Cienega and went into the Beverly Center? No cops, no security, nothing. The two of us, him looking like Sly on crack, and <laughs> we... And I'm telling you, and, and I remember distinctly saying to myself, I'm crossing La Cienega with Michael Jackson, and nobody knows it! <laughs> this is crazy right now! This is crazy! And we're walking in, man, and I'm like, okay, this is just going to be interesting. So uh, we're walking around, and we go to different uh, stores, whatever, and every once in a while he buys some. He didn't buy a lot of stuff, but um, <laughs> I remember when, like, he went, we were at uh, one uh Cashiers and he put the credit card down, and this is the reaction, right? He'd be like, This is the cashier I'm doing now, right? So, <laughs> so there was that, and then um, we, 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 we ended up in one of those uh, 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 big department store uh, gift wrapping. Sections, you know how like a Macy's would have like a gift wrapping department. So we're sitting there waiting for something to get wrapped. And he noticed this little kid with a funny shaped head. Like he had like a hook head, kind of like an extent, right? And so he started giggling at him. I'm like, shut up. And of course, the more I said shut up, what do you think he did? The more he giggled. I'm like, you shut up. He's like, <laughs> I'm like, get. So, you know, we finally got out of there. And we're walking around and people sort of started slowly catching on to us. But... It never got crazy. We, we actually got out before we had to be chased out. But it was insane. It's like, I can't believe I just went in the Beverly Center with Michael. You can't make this stuff up, but that, it actually happened. It was, that's one of uh, uh, several uh, wonderful moments. Um, and I've had a couple full circle moments with them, too. Uh, the, the first one was backstage at Madison Square Garden, September 10th and 8th of 2001, I'm standing in the huddle with them like this as their music director saying, all right, guys, have a great show. And I, I, I told them, I said, you know, I, I can't believe I'm at this point in my life with you telling you this when I saw you guys on Ed Sullivan, you know, I was in junior high when I Want You Back hit and I was a little kid in Detroit dreaming about what it would be like to meet you. And I'm standing here as your music director backstage at Madison Square Garden getting ready to tell you to have a great show. Let's go get them. Uh, there was that. And then the second full circle moment happened just recently, a little over a week ago. Uh, the brothers received keys to the city of Detroit. And I was there to help them celebrate. And I'm sitting in the audience, and they're there, you know, getting these massive plaques, you know, on stage. And do you know that Jermaine and Marlon, in, in, in separate speeches, uh, acknowledged me in the audience? And they said, we have a special friend from Detroit, and he's here to sell And it's Greg Fillinghams. And they, they actually said that. And they were so sweet. And then backstage, I went uh, to take pictures of them holding the plaques. And Jackie says, come on over here, man. So I took a picture with them just as I dreamed of doing, you know, being with the Jacksons, getting the key to the city of my hometown. Like, I'm, you know, come on, man. You, this is unbelievable. Can't make this stuff up. So just one of a bazillion blessings in my career. And uh, I have, like, a few thousand other stories. But I'm going to take questions now because it's, you know, we, I could be here all day. Yeah, yeah. 
We only have two minutes left. See? I I am so sorry. Do we really have? Is there is there another thing happening after this? We can set up drums. We got two minutes left. I know. How about how about a song? How about a song to take us out? Awesome stories. I don't know what to play. I mean, I, I uh, play Layla. <laughs> it's a guitar song, dude. Uh, I I don't know now. I I don't know. No, that's too slow, huh? <laughs> Earth, wind, and fire. Well, uh, man, and, well, that's man and mirror. That could be. Uh, well, let me see. Um, uh, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know. Let me see. Uh, okay, well. Well, I tell you what. I tell you what. I tell you what. I will do something that I do for all my friends on their birthdays. Now, who has a birthday either today or coming up really soon? You today? Okay, and coming up real soon. Okay, so check it out. This is what I do. I call them up and I go. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Greg Phelan Gaines. Thank you. Um.